Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the module eight of our digital neonatal nursing course. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the um, nervous system and the developmental care. And I'm a little bit sad because today is the last module of the series. And I think I would like to thank you all for participating for being with us over the past 12 months and uh, taking an active part during the discussion um, during our webinars. I'm extremely grateful to our honored speaker, Ms. Linda Pretorius, who relentlessly delivered amazing lectures and amazing content over the past 12 months. And of course, as a recap, we would like to, um, I, I would like to just to summarize on what we have covered in the past 12 months. We have started with the golden hour and the topics on neonatal resuscitation. We have then moved on to the uh, thermoregulation and the respiratory system of the neonates. We have also covered all the essential uh, vital systems of the term and preterm infants. And today we are closing with probably one of the most complex topics, the nervous system of the neonates. Once again, I would like to welcome Ms. Linda Pretore, who is our um, speaker today and over the past 12, uh, eight webinars. Uh, Ms. Linda has um, an extensive experience in neonatal care. She has worked in the UK, she has worked in uh, South Africa, she has worked on establishing the uh, guidelines of neonatal care in South Africa, and we are extremely grateful to have her as our speaker. So, um, as a part of today's lecture, we're going to focus on the nervous system, the physiology of the nervous system. We're going to talk about the um, cooling and the um, uh, birth asphyxia and the treatment for birth asphyxia, and at the end, we are going to address some of the key components of the developmental care. And as a part of the demonstration, I'm going to talk a lot, a lot about the importance of kangaroo care, skin to skin contact, and also some of the aspects that can contribute to protecting the brain of the preterm infant. So get yourself comfortable, get a cup of tea, and we are ready to start. So Linda, the stage is yours. We can now switch to the lecture. Good morning to everybody um, at, on the lecture. And this is, as Margarita said, the nervous system. I would like to make a few comments before we go any further. Um, this has been a great honor for me to produce and to present this course. And um, I think we have tried to keep it as topical and as, as um, having the latest info as much as we can. And what I would ask is that you perhaps go back and look at the lecture that we did last month on endocrine because these two systems actually flow into one. So let's start with any further ado and talk about the fetal development of the brain. So it is very important for you to realize that the brain grows throughout pregnancy, but there is a period, the last trimester, where the brain actually grows very, very rapidly. So if we look here at day 25, post-conception, the baby's neural tube has formed and the brain and spinal cord are there. So there you've got the neural tube. The spinal cord is there. And what you're starting to see is the start of the brain. By nine weeks into the pregnancy, which is around about here, the brain is small and a very smooth structure. And this brain will then continue to continue to grow. And then when we get here at six months, which is our micro premies, our 26 weekers and more, you can see the brain is basically in the structure as it should be, but it's extremely smooth. And I need you to understand that as we progress through this lecture, 
that you keep this in mind because this is often where problems arise when we are dealing with these babies. So as you can see, maternal stress can affect the brain development, infection can affect the brain development, and maternal nutri nutritional status can affect the brain. Prenatal exposure to harmful environmental st stresses, such as um, the mother being stressed, domestic abuse, um, low um, availability of food, all will affect the developmental growth and of, of this brain. One of the, the latest um, studies have shown that obesity in pregnancy is very clearly now linked to impaired neurodevelopment, executive function, and when we talk about executive function, that is the child's ability to regulate within a classroom and the child being able to concentrate even though if there's a lot of noise around the baby or the child. So it is the child's ability. Executive function also has to do with your ability to read and write and to deal with mathematics and language. And so very often when we have impaired development, there are problems accessing executive function. And this will also include the diagnosis of autism and ADHD. Bacterial infections have been um, associated with very poor neurological outcomes. Bacterial infections um, that have transmitted from the mother to the baby. Babies whose mothers were exposed to high levels of stress, as I've said, and anxiety, are at a much higher risk of developing depression, um, autism spectrum um, disorder, schizophrenia, and ADHD. And just on this, um, I'm going to start mentioning something called the tulip bulb famine. So in 1944, just towards the end of the Second World War, in the Netherlands, there was a, a, a very distinct area that had the food cut off to it. And the food was cut off on one specific day and the food returned um, six months later on one specific day. So the one side of it, Germany stopped the food and when the allied forces moved in, they brought in the food. Nothing was thought of this famine. People lived off about 25% of the kilojoules they had. They were supposed to. Most people were eating tulip bulbs and, and, and low nourishing foods that were available. Let's move that on for a, another um, 50 to 60 years. And in the late 80s, early 90s, they found in, in, in the Netherlands that they had a cohort of about 40,000 people that all had similar problems. They, and many of them were suffering from marked obesity or severe obesity. Many of them had severe hypertension problems. Many of them had diabetic issues, type two diabetes there was an increased number of schizophrenia and depression. And when they went back, they found out that these people, this group of people, this cohort, as we would refer to it, were all either fetuses for the full six months or fetuses for a shorter period in that famine. And what had happened was with the obesity, they had switched off what is known as the satiety gene. That is known as epigenetics, that switching off of the satiety gene. Um, for those that were there for a shorter period of time, they presented with cardiac problems and they also presented with hypertensive problems. And this, at the same time in the United States, there was another study happening, which we can perhaps discuss later. But what you need to understand is that this will have a knock-on effect to gen for a few generations on the brain. So we talk about in, in, in neonatology about nutrition, nurture, and nature. And that's what today is about. So nutrition of the brain is exceptionally important. And there are six nutrients which are essential for healthy brain development. Folate which you all know causes neural tubal defects and needs to be taken prior to you wanting to fall pregnant. And this present, prevents something called spina bifida. There are areas where we so-called refer to 
endemic spina bifida. Ireland is one such area, and so is the Eastern Cape in South Africa. And this is just because people don't have access to a lot of folate, which comes from your green leafy vegetables. Um, and in those areas, we see higher numbers of spina bifida. Generally, if two pregnancies follow quite fast upon one another, in a mother that's not got an optimal, nut optimum nutritional state, we will see spina bifida in the second pregnancy. Iodine, which causes a mental deficiency, it can cause deafness, mutism, and motor spasms. Vitamin D, which causes schizophrenia, which affects the brain size, the ventricle size, and the cell proliferation. And those of you who have attended every lecture knows that vitamin D plays a very important role throughout the, 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 the newborn or the, the, the um, developing fetus is, is progression. DHA, which is um, the, the, um, what we find in fish, in salmon, that's for infant problem solving, visual acuity, and we'll talk about that later language development, and again, autism. Again, a low iron has been um, linked to autism, ADHD, and intellectual disabilities, and choline, which is, an important, which is important for all tissue development, especially when we're dealing with epigenetics. Just on the iron, we now know that if we've had a preemie that has a low iron level, so a lowered HB due to low iron, those babies need iron supplements at least to six months of age to actually not have an intellectual disability. So let's look at the basic anatomy of the brain. The brain is divided into three major parts. The brain stem, which sits here. The cerebellum, which is this part here. And the cerebrum, which sits above this part, this, this part here, which details with planning and going and, and, and being able to make decisions. So if I was to look at your brain versus Einstein or Elon Musk's brain, you would basically all have the same size brain. The intelligence is considered to be here in the sulci and the gyre in this part of the brain. So it's the actual folds of the brain. So the brain is divided into two hemispheres with four lobes. The occiput, which is the back of the head, which is here, controls vision and some aspects of personality. This is why when we're talking about flat head syndrome, when babies have been laying on their backs for too long and this part of the head becomes flat, these children have visual and personality changes presenting later. Then we have the temporal lobe, which is this part here which has to do with hearing, language, social understanding, including nonverbal. The parietal part of the brain, which is very important, which sits here, and that's body functions such as hot and cold, pressure and pain. And then the frontal part of the brain here, which is memory, abstract thinking, planning, and impulse control, and the mirror neurons sit here. Now, it's very important when we are dealing with children and dealing with people in general that we understand that the frontal lobe only actually reaches its potential at about 25 years of age, and that at the age of about 13, every pathway that has been created in this brain that is not functioning we have something called pruning. So the, bru the brain automatically cuts away the pathways not used, tidies up the brain and makes it easier. The limbic system is very, very important in the brain of the preemie and the term baby. And so this limbic system consists of the hippocampus, which is memory and special learning, hypothalamus, which regulates um, the stress hormones, and the amygdala, amygdala the, the flight and fright response comes from there. So if we look, we are talking about this structure here. We're talking about the hypothalamus, which looks like a little seahorse that sits here, and the amygdala, which sits here. 
Now, these structures are going to come up in discussion quite a bit today, and it's very important that you understand this because this is the part that separates us from our reptilian brain, and this makes us a mammal. So, specialized nerve cells are called neurons, which communicate with one another. It has a cell body with a branch-like structure coming out of it. The dendron signal to other, the dendrite signal to other neurons. So, this will connect to another one and another one and another one. The message is passed from one neuron to the other through the synapses. Okay, so it comes in here. It goes down and it goes out there. Neurons don't actually touch. It's, there's fit in between them which will transmit it. And this is often where depression originates on because the, the, the fluids here are often stuff like ser serotonin. At seven weeks, the neurons and star synapses start forming. So the anatomy of the brain in the second and third trimester. The second trimester, the gyrane sulci start forming. So if we were to go back here, this part is the gyrae and sulci. The cortex starts to grow, myelination occurs. That's very, very important because myelination uses fat. Myelination comes from fat and that's where that comes from. The myelination is, allows for faster processing, so it stabilizes those neurons. The third trimester, the cerebral cortex starts taking over from the brain stem. In other words, we are moving from a reptilian to a mammalian structure, or we're going from the reptilian to the limbic system. So fetal breathing and the response to external stimuli. The cerebral cortex starts, uh, starts supporting early learning. And the reason why we've got this cat in the hat here is that in the third trimester from week 26 to week 32, an experiment was done where the parent, the mother was asked to read the cat in the hat to the baby every day while she was pregnant. And then the book was removed and the book was only given back to the baby at the age of three. And when they tested those babies, the babies very clearly knew what was coming in the book. The vestibular system. This is a very important part of the brain and it will come up again in development. The vestibular system is situated just under the brain in the middle ear. And from here, it sends important information to the cerebellum and beyond. Now, I am going to move back to here. So the actual, if you look at this carefully, can you see here's the, the, the ear and the vestibular system sits just beyond there. And what it does is it moves all the, um, all the stimuli, it changes it, it converts it, and it moves it up through here into the hypothalamus. And then it gets taken to the rest part of the brain. So what is vestibular? Vestibular is the movement forwards and backwards, left to right, up and down, and upside down, and also round and round. And it is a very important part of the third trimester of pregnancy. Um, it's one of the first systems to be complete in the third trimester. It helps with regulation, especially during feeding. And later in life, your vestibular system helps with tasks such as reading and writing. It helps stabilize your eyes, even though you're moving your body and your head. And rocking has shown to reduce apnea and regulate a baby, allowing it to reach interoception. So here we have two MRIs, which are... I need you to understand. This is a term baby at 40 weeks of brain. And this here is a 26 weeker, you can see, brain at 40 weeks. Now look very carefully at the difference in the brain. You can clearly see this crossover structure here that is far whiter than what you see here. 
And this is because this baby was premature. And if we're not careful nursing these babies, we can worsen the outcome of these babies because of the damage done in this area here. So let's quickly talk about oxytocin. We have spoken about oxytocin in the last lecture. It comes up here again. Oxytocin is known as the love hormone, but it is actually the hormone that acts directly on organs and it's a chemical messenger in the brain allowing the baby or the person to reduce its stress and anxiety level, levels and allows the person to get control of what's going on. So it's only released in specific situations. When we get a baby in intensive care, this baby, especially the preemie, will go into what we call the flight and fright system. And flight and fright can be a constant problem in intensive care if we as nurses don't control the environment. Now, this is a brain of an adult who had constant stress or something that we refer to as ACEs during childhood. This is a normal brain that you see here. And when you look here, you can see these areas here are missing. Now, you remember what I said about frontal brain development. Can you see this frontal brain hasn't developed? This is due to stress in childhood, and that would include the period in neonatal intensive care. So it's the physiological reaction which, in, which occurs in response to a harmful attack or threat to life. And it, is, it causes the release of cortisol. Short-term cortisol saves lives. So if we were to open the door, and there were intruders there, automatically our sensory system kicks in, we, our eyes widen, we breathe faster, our muscles relax, because we're either going to have to fight this or run. But long-term overexposure to cortisol will damage the brain. So what does cortisol do? It increases the heart rate, it increases the blood pressure and the respirations, the metabolism. It makes sure pain is blunted and it helps, it affects the memory. So that is what cortisol does short term to save a life. But if you're constantly exposed to cortisol, it starts making changes in the brain. So let's talk about the hypothalamus. This is this little seahorse-like structure that sits here. Um, and this is where this is where it all starts because the stimuli starts here this part of the brain receives the stimulus it sends it to the pituitary gland sends it to the pituitary gland the pituitary gland so the cortisol release happens here in the hypothalamus it sends the message down the way to say to the pituitary gland save us, save us, save us. This, the, the pituitary gland now sends the message to the adrenal glands to release all this cortisol to get it to help this person to survive. But if you over secrete this, it becomes problematic. So it then goes to the, the, the vital organs such as the heart, the lungs, and, and, and also the sensory system. What has now transpired is that when we use midazolam, in this country it's called Dormicum, it has shown to reduce the growth of this structure if we overuse or have too much Dormicum. And remember, we talk about medicinal ways of controlling stress and non-pharmacology ways of reducing stress. And this is where Dormicum can do lots of damage in a baby's brain, especially the micropreme. Then the next structure is the thalamus, which sits there. So here's the hypothalamus down here, this little skios, and there's the thalamus. Now the thalamus is known as the shunting center of the brain. So now considering again what I explained to you just now, the ear sits here, the vestibular system. So when we use our senses, the five senses, so taste, smell, 
sight and hearing will come in via the front of the face, if, you, if I can say it that way, and go to the vestibular system and touch will move up the spine to the vestibular system. It will then enter and there's magic things that happen there. The, the stimuli changes a bit and it enters the thymus, the th thalamus of the brain. When it enters the thalamus of the brain, this is known as the shunting station of the brain. This is where everything starts moving and goes places, okay? And it gets filed in the various places it needs to happen. This is totally dependent on the vestibular system. Just park that idea at the back of your head. Because what will happen is that if the baby's overstressed, this system can't work properly because it's not receiving the stimuli, or that's what we think, there may be an overload to stimuli. And what this does is it causes processing problems of the sensory system in the body. And it also affects the alertness of this baby. So now let's talk about the germinal matrix of the brain. The germinal matrix of the brain is that that the neurosystem originates from. It's in the brain up until about 32 weeks and then it starts disappearing. So all these neuro cells that are needed arise from here and as the brain grows, they move away. So it sits between the ventricle, there's the ventricle and the normal brain. And this is the factory of the brain cells. It has got a very rich brain supply. And metabolically, these cells are at their, these are the cells in the body that burn the most energy um, during any phase of life in the body. So it's very important to remember that. They, the, the blood vessels there are very fragile and it's disappeared by, by the time the baby is turned. So why is the germinal matrix so important? Well, this is where the intraventricular hemorrhage arises from. And so what you need to understand is, remember what I said, by 32 weeks, it is starting to disappear. So the vulnerable stage is between the ages of 26 weeks and 32 weeks. However, we are now standard seeing more 25 weekers, more 24 weekers, odd 23 weekers, odd 22 weekers. And so you must be very aware that this part of the brain is exceptionally vulnerable. And this is where the IVH originates from. So uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, we talk about an IVH. It generally happens in the, in, in the germinal matrix of the brain within the first 14 days of life when the baby has been born. So here are the ventricles in the brain. And you can see this bleed has originated in the germ, in the matrix of this brain. This injury only occurs in, the, in a hospital setting where premature infants are born. That's what iatrogenic means. It's created by us. It happens due to the fragility of the matrix vasculature and a disturbance in the blood flow of the brain and a bleed starts to occur. 90% of the blood to the brain occurs via the carotid arteries. The carotid arteries run in the front of your neck. Only 10% come via the vertebral arteries. And therefore it's important when you're dealing with a micropremi or a nanopremi to nurse them naturally or on the side to side for the first 72 hours. Because there's also something magic which happens. In the first 14 days of life, this matrix, this germinal matrix stabilizes once the baby is born. And that's why we only should see in IVHs in the first 14 days of life. But, but, most importantly, 
these IVHs seem to occur in the first six hours of life and are linked to events such as vigorous resuscitation. Babies develop IVHs by a very high risk of neurological sequelae such as hypocephalus, cerebral palsy, mental retardation, or what we call cognitive problems and developmental disabilities such as CVPs. Periventricular hemorrhages have a far better outcome with early in... Now, I have to explain this to you. When there is a, a germinal matrix bleed, a grade 1 or a grade 2 IVH, it happens here and we can see it. A grade three is when it enters the ventricle and then there's a pressure that occurs here and we will discuss that shortly. And that is where the damage comes from a grade three and a grade four bleed. In babies weighing less than 1500 grams, it has been found that 48% of those hemorrhages have occurred in the first um, six hours of life. 50% have occurred within it have occurred by 24 hours, not after by. And then a further 25%. So if you add this up, 75% of the bleeds have happened in the first 48 hours of life. It would appear the younger the baby and the more vigorous the recess, the higher the risk to this bleeding because this bleeding doesn't stop. It is slow and ongoing. Active labor in a micropremia is also known to cause this bleed. Most IVHs are silent, but the symptoms are very often apnea, bradycardia, low-toned babies, so floppy babies, bulging um, fontanelles, that's a bad sign, drop in HB, and we should be doing routine ultrasounds at least by day three. We should be doing it earlier, but at least by day three. Now, if we look here, <clears throat> this is the normal brain. And again, we're talking about the ger germinal matrix here. A grade one bleed is linked there. A grade two bleed is 50% of that volume. So you can see it there in the gray matrix on one side. A grade four, it says he has involved in 50% or volume or extension into the ventricle. And a grade four will come out. This is very, very important to remember. So if we have a small hemorrhage or a grade one, there may be a 10% chance of major neurodisability. Moderate hemorrhage or a grade two, there's a 40% chance of major neurodisability and a 10% mortality chance. And severe hemorrhage or a grade three will give us major neurodisabilities up to 80% plus a 50% chance of developing hydrocephalus. So what will happen, this is known, these two ventricles here are known as ventricle one and ventricle two. It then drains into what is known as ventricle three, which has an aqueduct which goes into ventricle four, which communicates with the spinal cord. If this bleed develops clots and it goes, it blocks the aqueduct, the upper two ventricles will enlarge. Some babies just have an enlarged ventricle, Black or mixed race babies often have one larger ventricle to the other. That's a normal anomaly. As long as the brain outside of the hydrocephalus is growing and there doesn't seem to be any growth retardation, we often leave that hydrocephalus and wouldn't put in a shunt. However, in Utrecht, in the Netherlands now, they have shown that if they do have this hydrocephalus and they actively deal with it, which we've never done before, if they actively deal with it, put in a, do a lumbar puncture reg regularly and even attach it to an external shunt, the damage is less. So let's talk about cerebral blood flow or CBF. 
Cerebral blood flow, CBF, is reliant on cardiac output and autoregulation. So how well the heart is beating and how it's pushing the blood to the brain. Remember what we said when we were talking about the cardiac lesions and the respiratory lesions. We said to you that with a duct, whether there's a duct or not, it, it doesn't matter because it's brain sparing because it comes off prior to the arch of the aorta. So the blood flow to the carotid artery, and remember I said to you, 90% of the blood comes via the two carotid arteries, only 10% via the vertebral artery. So 90% will put the blood into the brain. The problem with the brain baby is they don't have autoregulation. And hypotension is not consistently associated with IVH. It is actually the fluctuations which worsen it. If a baby is hypertensive, but there's good cap capillary refill, good heart rate, good urine output, no acidosis, no apnea, no bradycardia, it should be okay. The respiratory status also affects the cerebral um, brain function. And just now we are going to quickly talk about how the respiratory function affects this. Hypercapnia, that means a CO2, a climbing carbon, CO2, is associated with IVH. That's why we do not want them to stack their, their CO2. Bicarb infusions have been shown to lead to, lead to a ra rapid raise in CO2, which increases the risk of this. And this is very often, it has been shown that we shouldn't be giving bicarb cocktails, but often we are nursing ourselves and the doctors and not the brain. Try to avoid extremes in, in, in the saturations during recess and in the delivery room. In actual fact, how we deal with the baby in the delivery room is absolutely key to preventing an intraventricular hemorrhage. Now we talk about a periventricular hemorrhage or a hemorrhage infarct, which is also known as the grade three IVH. This is when the bleed actually compresses the veins of the brain. So if we go back here and we talk about it here, this bleed actually is now pushing on the veins of the brain. Remember, arteries take oxygenated blood to, veins take deoxygenated blood from. So you don't have a problem with the blood entering the brain, but now we've got a problem with the blood exiting the brain in a grade three bleed or what is known as a periventricular hemorrhage infarct. So it puts pressure on that brain. And basically, it causes a stroke. That is why the neurodevelopmental problems arise. When we talk about dilatation, which is what I've just said to you about the baby having hydrocephalus, this develops after this. So most babies who've had a bad grade 3 bleed or grade 4 bleed will present with what is hydrocephalus, these enlarged ventricles. This starts putting pressure on this developing tissue around the brain. And remember, in the third trimester, that is the part of the brain growing the most rapidly. This is why we need to monitor circumference of the head every week, because we need to be aware of it. In many babies we, that have this, we need to put in a shunt. And what a shunt is, is that it's, it's, it's a little pumping system that gets put through a, what we call a burr hole through here into this ventricle system and it will drain it. But it is very difficult and cannot in most instances be done in the first 14 days following a bleed because this brain tissue will be friable. That's why what Etrech is doing now is so phenomenal because they are draining it before or the aqueduct actually closes. So if you look here, you can see the Sylvian fissure. 
The Sylvian Fisher tells us whether the duct is open or closed. And by utilizing that is what they would do. Motor and cognitive issues may occur in this baby quite often. It doesn't always lead to cerebral palsy and it most likely is to be mild. So what are the risk factors for an IVH? A vaginal delivery, low APGAS, platelet or coagulation issues, severe RDS, pneumothorax, hypoxia, hypercapnia, seizures, and a PDA. These are all risk factors for an intraventricular hemorrhage. Now there's something else that occurs in these babies called periventricular leukomalacia. This is different to an intraventricular hemorrhage. Babies can have an engraved ones and twos. We will see PVL, that's what it's called, developing. This is an injury to the germinal matrix and it can be spotted or it can be a bleed. It usually affects the area where the neurofibers are that will affect the legs, the function of the legs. And very often what happens in these babies if they don't receive sufficient or they've had a large amount of cystic periventricular leukomalacia develop, they will present with cerebral palsy to their legs. Now, the interesting thing about periventricular leukomalacia is that it has very clearly been linked to ventilation. So we can't just go on, oh, well, this is what we're going to do. What they found was, and this is a study done in Montreal, I think, they found that in five years, they suddenly dropped their development of periventricular leukomalacia in micropremies from 2% to 0.2%. That is a major drop. It is a tenfold drop. And when they went back, what they found was that there was this whole move towards what we call gentle ventilation. And this has improved because of the advent of gentle resuscitation, early surfactants, starting on CP CPAP, not automatically ventilating the baby. You must earn your ventilator. And when you earn your ventilator, we use gentle methods of ventilation. And if you want to know about those, it is covered very nicely by Margarita in the, in the respiratory part of, of, of this lecture series, gentle ventilation. It is being gentle with it. So it's not just brain, uh, lung protection, but it has shown to protect the brain as well. And this is where the secret lies. These babies, by um, um, just by the way, these babies will often, when we assess them at about a year, they will walk outwards with the, with the leg. They might not be as strong in that leg. They may actually um, battle crawling. They'll crawl to the outside with that leg. Those are the babies that we see. What are the nursing um, considerations? We need to do delayed cord clamping. This is essential. We need to avoid head down and we must keep the head at 30 degrees. It is, and, and it's tempting. It is tempting to lay a baby prone a micro preemie when we first receive them. This is no longer what we need to do. They should be nursed in what we call midline positioning or in the, in, on their backs in what we call straight up nursing at 30 degrees or nursed from side to side. Why? Because when I turn this baby this way, the carotid artery on that side, on the, on the bottom side of it, will become a bit compressed. And that in itself is problematic because that will cause a problem. So we don't want that. For the first 72 hours, we want the head slightly lifted and in the neutral position or nursed from side to side. There must be a minimizing of pain and procedures. And it's important that we, we, we realize this. Midline um, positioning is important. 
slow infusions if you're going to do them, minimally handling these children, and we'll talk in the developmental block about that, reducing the noise, gentle handling, and flexing of the baby. By flexing the baby, you improve the cardiac return, therefore you improve the flow to the brain. What is the family-centered care we need to do? We need to support these parents, educate, 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 repeat, 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 because they don't remember everything. Explain to them and try and verbalize their feelings. Try and identify their feelings. Say, are you feeling anxious? If they say, that, if they appear anxious or they, 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 there's rapid wording or they're scared, identify the feeling for them. Encourage skin to skin in the microprem after 72 hours. Very, very important. Show them how to massage hands and feet during this period because you're going to release oxytocin, which is going to reduce the cortisol, which is going to allow introception or the regulation of the um, hemodynamics. Ensure flexion, I've explained to you, and we will involve these babies in early intervention therapy. We will start talking to the parents about it. And that is that part of it. Are there any questions, Margarita? So there is a question. Good day and thank you for the presentation. I would like to clarify if I understand it correctly. No prone positioning for premise within 72 hours of life. And after 72 hours, prone positioning with caution to keep neck pain on good alignment, not to increase pressure. Is that correct? So when we're talking no prone position, we're talking about the micro and the nano prem. So it would be for me in a unit, the baby's under 20. 28, 29 weeks. The baby's sort of at 30 weeks. If you're well skilled at what you're doing and you can observe the baby, that's fine. But it is to prevent, it is to maintain that cerebral blood flow or cerebral perfusion properly. So it's it's not the preemie, it's the micro preemie that we're trying to present it in. Remember that the, the germinal matrix is basically there um, up until about week 30, 31, and then it starts disappearing. So the chances of a hemorrhage is much lower in the 30 to 32 weeker than, for instance, 26 to 28 weeks. And that would be, once we get to 72 hours, we can do kangaroo care, we can um, put them prone, we've just got to be careful. And by 14 days, irrespective, of prematurity, you can prone those babies with great success. But it would depend on one or the other. Remember what we said, that um, the research has shown gentle ventilation um, works. And so that goes together with proning because proning is used with ventilation. So we've got to weigh it up, what is the best. But the suggestion very clearly is, and there's a paper that was published last week that talks that um, brain protective mechanisms don't always work. However, we do know from the research done on bigger patients, on adult patients, that cerebral perfusion pressure in those first 72 hours is essential. I hope that helps. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda, for answering so extensively. Um, we have no more questions, so I think we can continue with the lecture now. Okay, we'll do. Okay, so now we're going to talk about H HIE or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So HIE is something that happens from 38 weeks onwards mostly. Mostly, but the baby could suffer hypoxia earlier in utero, but it's not well described in what we would term the premature infant. And this occurs when, so HIE actually occurs when there's been hypoxia, lack of oxygen, ischemia, so restricted blood flow to the brain, and it is affecting the brain. 
Now, there's, it occurs when the brain does or not receive sufficient oxygen or the blood flow or both for a period of time during labor and birthing has been prevented. Now, this could happen with cord pressure. It could happen with a, um, a prolonged second stage. And it often happens in very large babies. And it, it goes back to what we spoke about, is that it's an important concept to remember that if the heart is not filling sufficiently, it cannot send it to the brain. And what do we see in that prolonged second phase of, of, of delivery? We see this tachycardia, prolonged bradycardia, increased tachycardia. And that's where the problem comes because the tachycardia is the heart trying to get the blood pressure up. It fails. We see a bradycardia. In that time that there's bradycardia, you get a better filled system. And then the blood supply is back. So the blood supply to the brain is very erratic. Usually affects a term or near term baby, and the incidence is about 1.5 to 2.5 deliveries in every 1,000 live births. But guys, this injury is devastating. Devastating. 40 to 60% may die before their second birthday or have severe disabilities. Very, very difficult situation for parents to cope with. The brain also suffers energy loss during this time. Remember what I said to you, that general matrix cells are the cells that metabolize energy the highest ever in the body. But when a brain is under severe pressure, the actual energy use is high. And the problem is that this brain then suffers because it's not getting sufficient energy. So what is, there's primary energy failure. Primary energy failure. This happens during the reduced cerebral blood flow period when the oxygen and glucose are starved from the cells and there's lactic buildup. If you go back to the endocrine lecture, if you go back to the hemodynamic lecture, you will see the amount of importance we have placed on monitoring the glucose and remembering, remembering that if you've got a raised blood glucose in the circulatory system, so if I prick your finger and your glucose is raised in your blood, it means that your cell is missing out on that blood because somehow the insulin has failed to take the energy, the, the glucose, from the actual blood into the cell. And that's where the damage occurs. So there's oxygen and blood, which occurs during the hypoxic ischemic um, insult. They then, we then go to anaerobic metabolism and a depletion of ATP. And then it has this knock-on effect. So the primary energy failure happens in the first few minutes to few hours and then later we'll get secondary failure so at this stage there's there's a membrane depolarization that happens there's intracellular increased calcium and an influx of sodium and this causes early neuro neurology de death and necrosis that's where that occurs from so due to various reactions there's cerebral edema, that puts pressure on the brain. There's ischemia, so there's death. There's microvascular damage and necrosis. And this then causes a global brain injury. If you have generally an IVH or PVL happening, it is usually one-sided in the brain. That has a much better outcome to something that we consider a global brain injury. The only other global brain injury that is as bad as HIE is a near drowning. And the mechanism 
is similar. So together with the cell necrosis, there's then an inflammation that occurs. And that occurs, and there's damage in the white matter, scarring which occurs. Remember what I said about PVL, it happens in the white matter of the brain. The white matter is the so-called fatty part of the brain. Once blood flow is restored, there may be a brief period of recovery with normal metabolism. And this may occur within a couple of hours or days. It is very important to return that blood flow. Now, if we talk about this, that we've got the cerebral edema which occurs in the brain, that is problematic because with cerebral edema, we have problems with cerebral blood flow. It can either prevent the blood from flowing into the brain or out the brain or both. And that's where the problem occurs. The secondary energy failure that occurs occurs between 6 and 48 hours after the initial injury. This is why it is suggested to cool them for 48 hours. And it appears to be related to oxidative stress. So because there's a problem with the oxygenation of this brain, remember that? And the inflammation, there's a problem of getting the toxins out of the brain. So we have this primary cerebral injury loss because there's this high energy usage, there's brain acidosis occurring, there's impaired cerebral blood flow and oxygen. That then leads directly, here's the resuscitation, to a brain injury, which causes immediate neuro, neuron, neuronal death. If we resolve it, so post-treatment, we can have no brain injury, or we can have secondary energy failure here with brain injury. So you could have neuro neuronal death here, but you can have neuronal death here as well. And that's where the problems occur. That is why cooling has been suggested. So how do they score these babies? We have a grade one, a grade two, and a grade three. The grade ones generally do quite well. The grade twos can go either way, and the grade threes, these babies very often are given what we call palliative care. So the level of consciousness is very important, reading these babies, seeing if they are irritable or hyper alert. Grade two babies are lethargic, and grade three babies, you're getting no response from them. What are their tendon reflexes doing? Increased, increased depressed or absent. This already tells us that there's lots of damage in that brain. Seizures, we don't see them here. We see them here and here. And seeing that seizure is important. We can have what we call subclinical seizuring. So suddenly you'll notice a bradycardia drop and sat, but the baby's not moving. You don't see snaking. You don't see cycling. And then it improves again. That often is described by the neuro neurologist as subclinical seizuring. So something's happening in the brain, but we're not seeing it come out in the body. Complex reflexes, normal, weak, absent. Here we're talking about ATN reflexes um, and, and other reflexes. Prognosis, good. Variable, high mortality, neurological disability, and death. This is devastating to a parent. So what do neonatal seizures look like? We're talking about subtle um, seizuring, which is the eyes, they stare, they might deviate, they might just blink. Orally, they look like they're chewing, sucking, su sucking or they lip smack. Limbs, they cycle, they swim, or they row. And, and, and how do you know that it's not just a movement? Put your finger on and see if you just put mild pressure on whether it stops. If it stops, that might just be due to 
a calcium or a magnesium need, but generally you have to look at that. Systemic, you'll see apneas, as I told you, tachycardia, but you often get a bradycardia with the apnea, blood pressure alterations. It may be difficult to, di to differentiate subtle seizures on the extremities. Many subtle seizures are thought to arise from the basal ganglia as there are, is diminished cortical inhibition. Further depression of the cortex with anticonvulsants may not alter these seizures. Now, clonic seizures usually involve one limb or two. There's jerky um, rhythmic movements one off to four times per second. And the consciousness is usually there. So don't go by that rule that a seizure is when a patient has passed urine. Doesn't work in neonatology. The two may be in the un underlying focal neuropathology, such as this is a hemorrhage or a cerebral infarct. It's important to watch these children all the time. Microclonic, rapid in isolated jerking of muscles may be focal or multifocal. This is often seen in abstinence um, uh, uh, syndrome, or it is also seen with um, other people. Can also occur with se severe form of encephalopathy. Microclonic seizures we do see often. Tonic. Sustained posturing of limbs or trunks devi or deviation of the head, it may mimic this decerebrate or decorticate movements. Those are movements inwards with the arms or outwards with the arms. Only 30% correlate with ECGs, and it's very often difficult to treat with anticonvulsants. It can be tricky to treat with anticonvulsants. So what are the treatment modalities for these babies? There are various cooling methods that can be applied um, and ventilation is most often what happens. So they will ventilate these babies, they will cool them and they will send them for an MRI, often post cooling. This baby has full body cooling. Now, cooling is very, very interesting. It has become quite a big modality in um, the last few years. You can cool a patient peripherally and affect the brain, or you can cool the brain by itself. This, where we cool the brain by itself, doesn't work as effectively as cooling peripherally. Because if you can drop the temperature completely peripherally, Remember, the brain is involved as well. So moderate hypothermia. And the secret is in moderate. Just because cooling works doesn't mean to say we must cool them too fast. That, that ain't going to work. So um, it is applied to prevent the secondary toxic or to reduce the secondary toxic effect. It is thought to reduce the free radicals and in, in, improve the glutamine level. Glutamine is used in various neuro, neuro, neuronal pathways, which affects things such as hearing, vision, sensory function, learning, and memory. So if we look at asphyxia per se, it's apnea. It can happen with um, uh, pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. It can happen with meconium aspiration, um, which we see often in Africa. It can happen with RDS, and it can happen with a pulmonary hemorrhage. And so then what we do, we have is we have decreased oxygen. Um, we have an increase in minute volume, and there's an issue in brain activity which alters here. So we have increased use of oxygen. We have inflammatory mediators which are triggered by this increased oxygen. And there's a reduced CO2 which causes cerebral irritability and can cause death of the cells. So when we do moderate hypothermia, it can be delivered by cooling the head or the body. The temperature needs to be between 33 and 36 degrees. For me, most people sit at about 34, 35. 
Usually the baby is rapidly cooled down to about 33 and held there for 48 to 72 hours and then slowly rewarmed. It is very important that you actually go back and look at the hemodynamic lecture and realize and, 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 and apply the errors that can occur. It is of no value cooling beyond 72 hours. In actual fact, they are shown to have problems with blood carpathy problems after that. It needs to be done within six hours of delivery and it doesn't reduce or improve the deafness that occurs in these children. And it won't change the outcome in severe HIE. Now, I've put this picture here for a very specific reason. This is a common error which occurs in a neonatal intensive care. This baby is obviously on an open incubator or resuscitator, and you can clearly see that the probe here is applied with some form of plaster. This is not going to be able to control your neutral thermal environment. And part of the trick, and if we go back here, this, is actually creating a micro neutral thermal environment. And if we go here, firstly, it is sitting virtually on the liver. Secondly, it hasn't got a reflex, a reflector on it. And so this is not going to give us the proper neutral thermal environment we require. And this is going to cause the machine to come on and off all the time. It would be better to move it over here and it would be better to have a reflector on it. But sometimes it is what it is. So moderate hypothermia can reduce mortality. But guys, when we go back here, it doesn't reduce or improve deafness and it won't change the outcome or sequelae in high, severe HIE. So when we start talking about mortality in severe HIE, we have to look at morbidity as well. It reduces moderate to severe neurological disability. That's important. That's important. With moderate HIE, it, it improves the prognosis of cerebral palsy, visual defects, cognitive delay, and psychomotor delay. These babies need early intervention therapy quite a lot, and the parents need to be very dedicated. There is a study at the moment, which is relatively new, whereby we look at stem cell transplants. Um, and this is when blood can be taken from the cord, and it is shown to show improvement in animal studies but currently it's only in the phase one of the human trial. Anti-epileptic medications and DHA. So um, anti-epileptic medication is, is being used and in combination with moderate um, hypothermia. So what they do is they will add an anticonvulsant, something like Epilim, something like Sodium Gardenol, um, they will give that to try epineutin is another one where, where they're trying to reduce the problem here and at the moment um, top year rate mate is currently being trialed as well um, and as far as i'm known the gene as well the other thing that they can add is dha so giving these children fish oil which reduces the inflammation in the hyper Campbell area. Remember what I said, that's where your sensory problems arise from. And this helps improve sensory motor motion function and neurobehavior later. Vitamin D has also been shown to have a neuroprotective and immune modulating property. Um, and the deficiency of vitamin D has been prevalent, prevalent in at least 70% of babies with severe HIE. This is important because there is not a lot of work being done amongst the obstetricians and the gynecologists that we are actually looking at mother's vitamin D levels during pregnancy. And it would appear that there is a link. We don't know how good it is or how strong it is, 
between lowered vitamin D levels and the development of HIV, severe HIV. So it doesn't prevent HIV, but the severe HIV it might actually have a neuroprotective part to the brain. Patients with low vitamin D who have strokes have worse outcome. So making sure vitamin D levels are adequate is very important. And in the COVID, we have found during COVID that vitamin D also plays a very important role. And so what it has forced us to do is look at vitamin D levels. And what we are finding is what we thought was normal is possibly not normal. And it actually is higher than we thought. So TPN versus feeding. TPN has also shown to help. So dextrose may su supply sufficient calories. However, TPN is shown to reduce catabolic states. Now, in the HIE scenario, it may actually be harmful to that brain. TPN increases the risk of late onset sepsis. Please remember that. Feeding has been shown to work, especially if colostrum is fed as it's neuroprotective. We've had this discussion before when we did the GIT system, by which I said to you that giving babies colostrum, especially the nano neuropremies, what we have seen is that we can actually pick up colostrum in the brain later on. It doesn't prevent intraventricular or leuco um, or PVL, but what it does do is it's neuroprotective long term. Very few cases of MEC are reported in babies with HIE. And breast milk has been shown to have anti-inflammatory properties. So what are the causes of HIE? A cord prolapse, uterine rupture, placenta rupture, maternal hypotension, or PIH or status epilepticus. Remember that these two run concurrently and will cause maternal hypotension during the status epilepticus part. Breach presentation, shoulder dystocia, and antepartum hemorrhages. But now we know that vitamin D is also linked to this. So what are the signs and symptoms of HIE? There's a varying heart rate during delivery. We've discussed that. There's a history of meconium aspiration or what is known as pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, the old PFC. Lowered abcars, meconium stained glycol, a requirement for vigorous resuscitation, seizures at birth, and severe acidosis. So pH below seven. Research has shown that the varying heart rate during delivery is the most sensitive indicator currently when you're dealing with HIE. It's one of the things that you must remember when you are standing at that bed waiting for the baby to be developed. And this was this has been shown via the meta-analysis of data done by Anderson et al. So knowing that there's been a variation in, in, in um, the heart rate during the second phase of labor should lead you to think about it. So what is the nursing care? Assess the situation at recess and prepare as far as possible. Anticipate you're going to need cooling, however you're going to do it. Prevent any secondary injury by ensuring that cooling happens as soon as possible preferably in that golden hour, but within six hours, and that you'll need full monitoring, including neurological monitoring. In a country like South Africa or in Africa, this would basically be observation. In countries in Europe and um, in more developed countries, they would monitor these children with an EEG as well. Um, with the, and a lot of countries now you use using the three lead EEG, which they put on the baby to monitor for this. Remember that within the African or developing um, country scenario, HIE is common because um, 
we we see a lot of meconium aspiration we see a lot of sick babies we do see um pulmonary hypertension of the newborn and th that would lead to higher numbers of hie we have to observe these babies for seizures and report and record it we have to maintain our blood gases very tightly and do not permit hyper or hypocapnia because this is going to affect the brain. Monitor the intake and output strictly. Correct any imbalances such as sodium. The sodium monitoring here is essential. Hypo in hypernatremia will give you seizures and that will worsen the outcome. Nurse the baby with its head in the neutral position. Handle the baby as minimally as possible. Do not actually fiddle with this baby. Start the colostrum as early as possible. Keep the area dark and quiet. Support and update parents. Explain the situation. Palliative care may be required, and you will have to start a neurological developmental program as soon as possible. Guys, it's very important. This is very scary for parents to, to observe, and it's very important that we actually monitor this very, very carefully. When we look at family integrated care, it is very essential that education and support is given here and that they are given as many, um, as much literature as possible to read because there will or there may come a time where a decision has to be made and this should be allowed. And for a parent to make a very difficult decision, and here I'm talking about palliative care or end-of-life care, they need to be equipped with as much knowledge as they can handle and deal with and if it means that we have to wait and come back tomorrow and go through it again that is what we need to do but educating these parents is essential um, i read an article yesterday that has just been published that looked at and this was done in premature infants but we can extrapolate through to this system here as well that looked at the severely ill child in intensive care and one of the things that prevents a parent from being able to filter and deal with information is very often the stress of an intensive care you and i work there daily and when we walk in and the oscillator is going, or as it's called in South Africa, Matatizela, and it's going do 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 do. That doesn't cause anxiety unless you've never worked with that machine. When you walk in and a baby's being cooled, that doesn't cause anxiety to you unless you've never worked with it. But to a parent, every one of those components being added to that baby worsens the stress. They had a picture in their heads that this perfect little baby was going to be born with daddy's color skin and mommy's eyes and daddy's hair and mommy's whatever. And now this baby's covered and they can't see the baby and there's electrodes on its head and it's making strange movements. They cannot process what you're trying to tell them. You have to bring their anxiety levels down, allowing them to process what you're trying to tell them especially if you come into end of life. Infection control, as I have said to you, these babies are very likely to develop late onset sepsis due to cytokine surging. Ensure that your equipment is clean when you commence therapy according to your hospital policies, as well as the manufacturing orders, and make sure that every shift the, the, the equipment is maintained and cleaned as possible far as possible especially during COVID and remember strict hand washing is very important and then we are at the break are there any questions thank you Linda for addressing this in my opinion one of the most important topics in neonatal care because we know that um, unfortunately perinatal asphyxia is still um, 
in the top three causes of mortality, especially in the developing countries. And um, I think it's quite important to highlight the, the risks associated with perinatal asphyxia and also the potential treatment option. Um, so thank you very much for in, including this topic into the lecture today. I think it's very, very important. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, perfect. So the first question is that, is there a difference between hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and neonatal encephalopathy? Or does HIE fall under the broad category of MNE? Yeah, it falls under it. There, if we say neonatal encephalopathy, there could be um, other reasons for encephalopathy, but they are what I would term red herrings. So the biggest part of neonatal encephalopathy is actually HIE, which goes with this ischemic episode that is with it. Um, uh, if you have a meningitis um, at birth, that could cause an encephalopathy. But as I said, they are red herrings. We don't see as many of them. Um, and it would be quite rare um, that we, we see it at birth. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, there's another question. Can vitamin D micronutrient be added to the treatment of HIE? It, it is starting to appear in the literature right now. Um, if the babies, uh, we, would, if, we would prefer to feed them orally, and then the absorption of vitamin D via the gut is very good. Um, and we are starting to see the use of it. Um, for me, vitamin D is probably one of the most essential nutrients that we should be giving as early as possible um, because of all the protective mechanisms we're seeing. But as a treatment per se, it's not mainstream yet. Great, thank you so much. Um, so far, that was all the questions. So I think we can continue with the lecture. If you do get any questions on HIE, you can type them in and we're going to have another two breaks to address the question. But I think for now, Linda, we can move on with the lecture. Okay, cool. So when, when we are looking at neurodevelopment, um, this is a a very basic course in neurodevelopment. And so um, we are going to talk about various um, aspects of neurodevelopment. For me, neurodevelopment is my bread and butter. And so it's something I'm very passionate about. And um, I think that neurodevelopment in the next five years is possibly going to become very mainstream and it is a very important part of your intensive care um, that you give the baby. It is not today, it's run of the mill for us to look after a baby. Basically, I always say I can teach anybody to take care of a baby in intensive care, but I cannot teach everybody to do the neuro developmental part or the actual care of the baby because it is actually becoming very integral part of it and in actual fact if you consider what is happening in the brain you can control a lot of the hemodynamics so one of the most important hormones to know about is cortisol and cortisol is the hormone that is secreted during stress. It increases the heart rate, the respiration, the blood pressure, the blood glucose, and the muscle tone, causing the body to shut down from learning and the memory to maintain survival. And this is why during when an accident occurs or a stressful situation occurs, like a hijacking or um, whatever bad happens in the world, uh, people's memory and the, what they tell you of the events is so much different to the next person. You don't get this 
cut and paste and copy sort of this is what happened. No, because of this cortisol release. In premature infants, cortisol often works up um, optimally and it causes changes to the developing brain. And it is during this over secretion or constant secretion of cortisol that the damage occurs in the brain and that possibly most likely leads to the neurodevelopmental delays in these babies. The problem is that a lot of people think that prematurity or something like HIE by two years of age, that baby should be over it. No, it doesn't. It will always be with that child or that human. And that's what we need to remember. So when we look at the effects of cortisol on the body, there are lots of things that happen. We get this decreased metabolism. We can get depression. We can get hypertension. We can get chronic fatigue. We can get sleep deprivation, migraines in, 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 in adults and late and, and children, teenagers. It, we can't describe this in neonatology because how are we going to know they've got a headache? There can be tunnel vision, acid reflux disease. Just keep that one in mind. Hostility, hunger, arthritic changes or pain. These are all problems that arise from cortisol. Now, early in the lecture, I told you that um, there was this study done called the tulip bulb famine. At the same time as that, that realization happened in the Netherlands, whereby they said, what is this? Where did this problem originate from? In America, um, there was a gentleman, a doctor who ran a weight loss clinic. And this will be very interesting for those of you who are night nurses. Um, this gentleman got a night nurse in that had an extreme weight problem. And they put her on a diet and she lost an incredible amount of weight, something phenomenal, like 180 pounds, which is like almost 90 kilograms. It's, you know, a whole person's gone. She did really well. And then suddenly after two weeks, she appears back and she has gained 18 kilograms, 36 pounds. And he's going, what's happened? Why has this happened? And he starts to try and investigate it and the lady disappears. And she comes back 18 months later, gained virtually all the weight back and the problem is still there. And he starts scratching the surface. And what he finds is that <clears throat> this individual had been sexually assaulted as a child. And the weight gain is due to this excessive cortisol levels. And she had lost all of this, but there was no psychotherapy. And what had happened was in that time that she'd gained the 36 kilograms, uh, uh, 36 pounds, um, a, a patient had made unacceptable um, approach to a sexual sort of thing towards her, which had triggered her. He then started looking at it and what he found was um, something called ACEs or um, Adverse Childhood Experiences and there are 10 of them and cortisol is linked to all 10 of these and that also then started showing us that we had the same problems originate in that cohort of patients and this study has now been um, expanded extensively and you guys can go and read about it but these people also present with hypertension with type 2 diabetes with obesity with um, psychiatric disease and it is all boils down back to this cortisol so the importance of cortisol in neurodevelopment can never be underplayed the problem being that in the premature infant, cortisol is often suboptimal and lingering around. Sorry. So, oh dear, let's just get this right. Okay. 
what's going on here now? Sorry, guys. Let me just get. Oh, I don't know why it's reversing. Let me just sort this out. Oops, now it's gone all the way back. Sorry. Okay, so oh, I'm sorry about this. So to counteract oxy, um, cortisol, we need to use oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is a hormone which acts directly on the organs. It's a chemical messenger in the brain, and it allows the subject to reduce its levels of stress and anxiety levels and gives a feeling of being protected and having trust. But it is only re released in very specific situations. So during the third trimester, as we get to the end of the pregnancy and the space gets left and we start getting Braxton Hicks contractions, that baby is receiving oxytocin. It almost becomes brain protective. That's not going to happen in the, in the preemie. When a baby is breastfed, it receives oxytocin. When a baby is birthed vaginally, it, ex it receives oxytocin. When you are massaged, you receive oxytocin. When you have sex, you receive oxytocin. But re realize what it says here. It creates a feeling of being protected and trust. So that baby being born vaginally gets this massive surge of oxytocin. It then gets brought skin to skin with the mother. The baby and the mother make eye contact. And now we get what is called attachment. That's the start of attachment. When a preemie is put skin to skin, it is given oxytocin. There is a certain amount of oxytocin release. And it is very important to know that oxytocin counteracts cortisol. And this is where the secret lies. That is why we ask you to buckle feed, because oxytocin in breast milk allows for what we call regulation. So now we are dealing with brain structure versus brain function. If the baby has had severe cortisol excreted for a long period of time, the brain structure changes, and that will affect the brain function. So structure versus function. If the structure has been changed or affected, it will involve the function. Sucking is a complex task and it involves motor function or core muscle with the suck, swallow and breathe. Now, if a preemie has been lying on its back all the time in intensive care and we haven't flexed it, so if I ask you to flex forward, to bend forward, you will feel your tummy muscles work. Who actually has reflux? It is the old man with the tummy. They are the people who suffer reflux because they haven't got core muscle control. But our babies reflux because they lay on their backs and they haven't developed core muscle. And with that, it puts extra strain on the baby to have to have a good suck, swallow, and breathe reflex during sucking. Now, if you look here, this is the brain, the gyrene sulci, and you can clearly see where in the brain what comes in. What I need you to notice is how close the arm and the mouth are because this is significant. If you've got a weakened shoulder girdle, suck is difficult. So often, we will also see these babies having what we term as deregulation or presenting with sensory overload. 
what does sensory overload look like? Sensory overload is eye gazing or aversion. So they look downwards and they stay there. They don't make eye contact with you. They can arch away from you. They use the stop sign. There's the stop sign, guys. Stop. I've had enough. They reflux. They can cry continuously or sleep continuously. They just never wake up. They just never are alert. They sleep poorly. They feed poorly. There's recurrent infections in these babies. There's poor weight gain and there's hemo instability. Let's just go back here. Let's look at it again. Decreased metabolism, loss of weight gain, hey? Sleep deprivation, tunnel vision, not making eye contact or looking down, reflux, constant crying, which we often interpret as hunger, which is possibly not hunger, and chronic fatigue and hemodynamic instability. And this is why it is so important to be able to look at the developmental care. This is not something that is nice to have. It's essential. So what happens during third trimester of pregnancy? Well, if you look at this baby here, during the third trimester of baby pregnancy, the uterus doesn't grow infinitely. It doesn't grow and grow and grow and give way. No, you become more and more and more uncomfortable because this baby is getting bigger. The uterus is now the size it is, and it starts folding this baby in on itself and midlining it. And at the same time in the brain, that is aiding the brain because now we've got this extension across here of the shoulder girdle and the hip girdle. And we've got this midlining which is happening in the brain. And this flexion is aiding the development of the core muscle. That doesn't happen in intensive care when you're lying like this. So what would you see happen here? You would have a shortening of these shoulder girdle muscles at the back and a shortening of the hip muscle. Well, Linda, what does that mean long-term? I mean, really, this is intensive care. Long-term means this baby can't crawl properly because you need to be able to extend your arms forward and backwards to crawl but you also need the crossover to have happened. And now you've got these shortened muscles here. So even though these arms are up here, which we don't want them to be, this baby long-term will battle to crawl and the hips will also, because the first sign that crawling is going to start happening soon is the baby brings its feet up and it plays with its feet. And that tipping of the pelvis is the start to crawling. That's not going to happen in a baby who's lay on its back all the time. This baby, if it wants to move its arm, can lift it and it might get there. This baby here, this little monkey here, will take its arm, move it, and hit its head. It's not supposed to make that movement. That is one of the biggest problems. Second problem is that in the third trimester, this mother, if she's as thin as a pin or as round as a ball, she will waddle. Waddling is vestibular movement. It is stimulating and processing this brain. It is moving things through that hypothalamus. It is going to act as the filing clock. That does not happen in this situation here. This baby receives no vestibular movement. At the end of your pregnancy, at week 37 to week 40, your baby probably receives about 20 hours of vestibular movement. You're getting up to wee at night, you're uncomfortable, you're moving in the bed, that left to right movement in the bed. That is all vestibular movement. It's not happening. The, that is the sixth sense in your brain, by the way. And your seventh sense is something called proprioception. This baby has no proprioception. This baby receives a lot of proprioception because there's feedback between every one of these joints and the brain because the uterus has got this baby in what we call a major hug, a big hug, it's holding that baby tightly. It, and during that hugging process, there's release of oxytocin. That's not happening 
in this infant here. So the two inner senses, what we call the stibula and proprioception, really goes missing in neonatal intensive care if we do not have an early intervention or a developmental program. So as we've said, we discussed, oh, here we go again. We've discussed um, the, what happens during pregnancy. And so what happens in the intensive care? There's a lot of light, toxic. There's a lot of sound, it's toxic. There's a lot of touch, it's toxic. This little infant here receives no touch. There's muscle layers here, guys, lots of them. So even if the mother was to touch the outside of, of, of her tummy, the baby would feel it, but it would not be direct touch. It's indirect touch. The only direct touch it receives is it touching itself. These babies are prevented from touching themselves, especially in archaic intensive care units where we do stuff like tying the hands down or, 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 or wrapping plaster around these babies, preventing them from movement. All sorts of funny things happening. That touch is important. This baby is already drinking 750 mils of micro a day. It is touching its face constantly so that when it is born, it is able to feed. But that doesn't happen. Everything that happens to this baby hurts. What have we lost? As I've explained, proprioception and vestibular movement. But why is the sensory system so important? So, when a mammal is born, and remember right in the beginning when I spoke to you about intraventricular hemorrhages right at the beginning of this lecture, I said to you that the mammal functions on the limbic system. Now, if we were to look at the human brain and we were to compare it with other mammals, the two mammals that we would use to compare our brains with would be elephants and whales. But what is different between the human, the elephant, and the whale? Well, this little mite here has just been born, and so is this one. And both of them can save their own lives. They can get up after 30 minutes here, this guy after 10 minutes, and they can swim. They, this guy can swim, this guy can run. But the newborn baby can't do anything of this sort. Because for us to have walked upright, we had to give something up. What did we do? We got a narrowed pelvis. So in actual fact, a term baby is a prem baby, which makes a preemie an extreme preemie, and, and so it goes backwards. And how do we know this? Well, if we look at this graph here, um, you can clearly see that the sensory system is very dominant at birth. That's why you can survive. Because what happens? There's that cortisol release, which makes your eyes get wide and which makes your smell work, which makes your heart rate go up. Because the eighth sense is interoception. It's bringing your hemodynamics together. And what happens here is this baby can now survive. And this is where a lot of the harm in developmental care is done because we are affecting the senses of these babies. So what is the flight and fright? The flight and fright response is a physiological reaction which occurs in response to perceived harmful attack or threat. A baby that is in a noisy, very light environment where they are constantly touched is constantly forced into flight or fright. There's constantly a threat. There's a constant secretion of cortisol. And this starts changing the brain. Remember we said earlier, increases the heart rate, the blood pressure, and the respirations, the metabolic rate, it blunts the pain. It changes the structures in the brain. Your frontal brain is where your executive function occurs. So what is regulation? For a baby to regulate, we talk about sleep states. So this arrow should actually run both ways. A baby can go from crying to active alert to calm alert to drowsy to light sleep to dark sleep. 
What happens in intensive care is this becomes one major big mess because if the baby's in deep sleep, normally it should go to light sleep, to drowsy, to calm alert where it can feed, to active alert where it's going to start crying or it cries. But this doesn't happen in this way in a baby in intensive care or a baby who is deregulating. This becomes a major mess. Many microprems go from deep sleep to crying and they skip all these states. And when they start skipping these states is when you start losing control in intensive care. So what is regulation? By utilizing the two inner senses, the baby's brain integrates the five outer senses. It can calm down, allowing it to have interoception. So if you get bad news or you've had something happen to you and you're hyperventilating and breathing fast, what are the two things that happen? The first is that somebody says to you, whoa, Linda, just breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. That allows me to regulate my heart breathes. That allows me to regulate my respiratory system. And that allows me to get control, which is interoception. The other thing that they do is they bring you sugar water. I don't quite know what that's supposed to do, but let's not bother about that. So the baby can't do that. I can't say to the baby, hey, listen, Baby easy, breathe in, breathe out. That's not going to happen. I have to regulate the baby. Then when the baby enters calm alert, so if we go back here, calm alert, that's where we would feed babies in. It can do it mindfully and learning occurs. And this is also when attachment to the parent occurs. And in neonatal intensive care, we can utilize massage and vestibular movement to enter calm alert. So if you look here, exactly what happens is the vestibular, the visual, and the proprioceptive enter the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, and the brain stem, which then gives us control over eye movement and posture movement, which gives us the sense of regulation. So when I see this baby, you can clearly see this is a highly stressed baby. Look at it. It is red. It is crying. It is uncomfortable. There's unstable eye movement. There's poor coordination. There's a light sensitivity. There's an auditory sensitivity. There's tense muscle. This baby's thin. There's nutrient. There's new nutritional issues and this baby's prone to weight gain when i turn this baby over it is going to have a very severe morrow reflex that morrow is a sign that this baby isn't regulating this baby is deregulated this baby is over secreting cortisol so what is the early intervention program? A healthy infant-parent relationship improves with improves developmental outcomes. That study that I told you about earlier that showed that um, the stressed parent cannot get anywhere. What we know is that very often, because we don't talk to parents regularly about early intervention therapy and getting these babies sorted as soon as possible. They take these babies home and they almost keep them in cotton wool. They don't do anything with this baby. And that affects the developmental situation for this baby. That worsens the developmental delay. And I can clearly tell you this, this little baby in this picture is actually one of my patients. He is now two years old, and I will show you a picture of him just now or a little video of him just now. He is a 25-weeker. I have another baby that is a year younger than this baby that's a 26-weeker. The mother's approach are totally different. This mother was not depressed. She coped well with early intervention therapy. The other mother has got a problem pushing her baby. This baby at a year 
was crawling, standing, and cruising on his first birthday. That baby has not started crawling yet, and his first birthday is two weeks away. That is the effect of stress of the parent in the NICU. A healthy, strong infant parent relationship allows an infant to learn self regulatory skills such as self soothing, sleep state regulation, and healthy feeding. And this is very, very important. Your job as a nurse is to improve attachment. KMC, skin to skin, is the best way of doing this because this parent regulates, the baby regulates, and they start getting control. It allows for a kind, caring child because the secretion of, of, of oxytocin has an epigenetic effect. It calms the baby down. It stimulates the oxytocin gene, which allows for a care, kind, caring person, individual. Attachment promotes strong scaffold, scaffolding. So the parent who's attached to the baby, who's comfortable with the baby, will exercise that baby, and that baby will develop strong scaffolding. It will reduce the neurodevelopment. It also improves attention, emotional regulation, and learning. So what are the pillars of neurodevelopment? It's motor skills. It's language and co communication. Language and communication is very dependent on motor skills. Social skills are, de are dependent on the language skills. Your, per your perceptions of what is happening and your attention and behavior will depend on these. So it is very important. And please, please note, no baby in your neonatal units can self-regulate. It does not help to say, let him cry it out. A crying baby needs to be picked up as soon as possible and soothed. So what does the early intervention program allow for? <coughs> the early intervention program is not an expensive program for a parent. And it allows for an enriched environment. So it facilitates enhanced cognitive, motor, and sensory stimulation, and it allows for the optimum, uh, the optimization of learning. And this includes the neonatal unit. Please, guys, it's important that we look at the colors and what we're doing in neonatal intensive care. So when we start the early learning program at home, this early intervention program. There's minimal toys that are needed. We do not use a baby gym. We actually use this A-frame. We use a mirror. We use lots of texture, and we often use a ball. Should the NIC baby not achieve regulation and modulation early on, they will develop sensory and learning disabilities with complex developmental and cognitive problems. So you have to already regulate this baby in the NICU. This often doesn't happen. And so what happens is this baby goes home and it takes months to regulate, therefore causing developmental delay. Modulation is the ability to regulate the incoming neural messages by inhibiting or facilitating a response to sensory stimuli. If I was to say to you, and I say to you now, can you feel your shoes? If you're wearing socks, can you feel that? That is modulation. Once you've put it on and there's no stimuli that's bothering you, like a hole in the toe or whatever, then your brain blocks that out. And that is about modulation. So being able to regulate and bring in the take, taking the incoming stimuli and processing it, that's the secret. Oral, auditory, and touch aversions are very common by discharge. Babies who won't suck, or babies that constantly suck. Auditory problems, babies who want to be in an environment where they have white noise constantly, or babies that need absolute quiet. Babies that arch away from you. Those are all signs of oral, auditory, and touch aversions. Motor skills are both genetic and epigenetic. And we need active scaffolding 
to develop these. Movement improves oxygenation to the brain. And for our babies going home, we insist that parents do at least 15 minutes of exercise twice a day combined with other things. Exercise for our babies is play and we involve movement, stretching, creeping and massage. So what happens when we exercise a baby? For a parent, we talk about play. For you, we're telling you we're actually exercising them. Well, look at these two brains. This is a scan of a brain sitting quietly, and this is a brain having walked for 20 minutes. So by move, moving these babies, by doing their passive exercises constantly, we are seeing these changes. There's a release of endorphins, and they will show up at the hippocampus, campus, which includes regulation, learning, and navigation. We also use the plasticity of the brain to get somewhere. The brain is most plastic in the first year of life, and therefore early intervention is important. So if I ask you what you see here, you're basically seeing black and white. You can't, unless you've seen what there is, but I'm going to tell you what there is. And when you see it, you cannot unsee it. So if you look carefully, there is actually a cow in this picture. Here's its ears. There's its eye over there. Here's a fence. And here it comes down to the nose of this cow. What has just happened is you have gone from sight to seeing. So visual perception linked to the vestibular system is very important. And this is why the light in the intensive care can be so dangerous. If you look here, this is what a newborn baby sees. Not much, is it? And this is what the baby will see at three months versus six months. That is why it is so important to use black, white, and gray images with a little bit of red. Because look here, mostly what this baby sees is red. So by 38 weeks, we should be stimulating visual perception. If it is not done, these babies battle to read. In actual fact, the teachers will write cat on the board and they may read cat. It is visual perception is also linked to spatial awareness. And remember that you see five times more than you hear, than you perceive via your mouth with taste and smell. And please, there may be no televisions in your natal units. The blue light overstimulates the brain. So what can you do in neonatal intensive care for early development, be very aware. Buckle feeding is very important. And hereby, for those of you who work night duty, it may be suggested to ask the mother to keep a syringe of the night milk for you separately, so that at night when these babies are unsettled, you can give them night milk, because night milk has more melatonin than day milk. They need at least an hour to 70 minutes of skin to skin in every 24 hour period. The research clearly shows done by Heidi Els, who is the mother of neonatal um, intervention, that by 48 hours post delivery, this baby has become almost depressed because it hasn't got the uterus to climb up against to move its legs and its arms, and it becomes flaccid. So we need to mimic the wound. The wound, this is supposed to mimic the wound, except that this is, by, uh, this is not um, three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. We need something over it. So this baby may actually need to have a blanket put across here, which is fairly tight, or it may be need to be swaddled. These are bonding squares. How do bonding squares work? Well, we ask mom to wear it as, as a breast pad and she will leak breast milk onto it. Breast milk smells and tastes like mom because breast milk, amniotic fluid, 
and mom's skin all smell and taste the same. And what we then suggest is that it's put up close to this baby so it can smell its mother and therefore think she's nearby. These cannot be made from wool. They need to be cotton. We ask for two different textures because that helps with sensory development. Flexion is important. This baby is definitely not flexed. Check your hemodynamics and make a change. Swaddle and rocking is important. A baby that's very unsettled, even this baby, you can pick up and literally mimic just walking. So gently rock from side to side for five minutes. And what you will see is that this baby's heart rate will come down, its breathing will improve, and its saturations will go up. This is very important for you as a nurse to calm the baby down. White noise may be needed. When we have the extreme preemie born and it must be lying in that neutral position, one of the things that you do need to do is use the incubator cover so that the baby is in that moist hybrid incubator in darkness and you can add a little white noise of a heartbeat very softly. When you open the door to that incubator, you must hardly hear it. And that will give the baby, and then put the bonding square there, and that will give the baby the sense that it is in the uterus. So what is the calming routine in, in ICU? Primary caregivers need to be mindful and present when they do the calming routine. This is the mother. It must be planned and prepared for. She must come there planned. She must bring her books. She must tell you what she's going to do for the day. They must use their senses to observe and learn the baby's cues. You may need to get the mother to breathe to regulate the baby because the baby is going to go skin to skin. And if you say to the mom, breathe deeply, breathe out, breathe deeply, the baby will regulate. Please give these parents privacy with their babies. This is not the time to come and chat to the mom or to confront her about something. Please leave her while this is being done. And how does the calming routine look? It helps stabilize the baby and gain weight. There is no reason, unless the baby is unstable, not to do skin to skin. So we use the ATVVPP program. A stands for auditory, so calling the baby's name and touching it with a specific tap, which indicates that that is mommy. So the mommy must have almost a tap that is just her, tapping the baby's cheeks, tapping the baby's head. That, so auditory, calling her name so she can hear mom's voice, touch so she can feel mom. Mom's tap automatically within 48 hours, that baby will know, oh, this is my mom. The first V stands for vestibular. So she can rock from side to side gently for a little period of time, even sitting to help that baby process. Remember at the beginning of the lecture, me saying about going through the hypothalamus. The second V stands for visual. The most this baby will see is from where I'm holding it on my chest, seeing my chest and maybe a little bit of my face. The next P is for proprioception. So especially the micropreme, when I'm holding it in skin to skin, to put pressure on that body, to hold it with my hands, to cup it, that gives the baby proprioception. And the next P stands for positioning when I put it back in the nest to flex it. If the baby is under 32 weeks for the first 72 hours, no skin to skin. However, we can do skin to skin in the delivery room to help bridge it over this period of time. But the baby still requires parental touch and voice. So that becomes very important. This is called cupping. The parent needs to firmly cup the baby while quietly humming. Under 32 weeks, don't use the voice. Humming is better. Ask the mum to have a song, her song. Ask the dad 
to have his song. And when they start humming that, the baby's brain realizes, oh, this is my mum. And that starts the regulation. You can ask them to massage the hands and feet with something like MCT oil. Recreate the womb, as I suggested, with white noise, darkness, and humidification. And the routine care can be reduced down to six hourly. It should be. Please read the baby's cues. So in intensive care, start KMC as early as you possibly can. The fact that the baby's going to the mother, then to skin, will transfer the mother's biome to the baby, therefore preventing late onset sepsis, but it also regulates with the excretion of the oxytocin. Ensure the baby feels safe, allow for deregulation and then regulation. If the baby starts to push up its heart rate, do not panic. Stay with the mom, talk in a quiet, gentle manner, and everybody will regulate. If the baby is under 32 weeks, allow the parent, as I said, to gently hum. As the baby stabilizes, you can start massaging hands and feet. And as the parent and the baby become more accustomed to one another, we need to ass assign more tasks to the mom. When we return to the nest, flex and secure, swaddle we, as soon as we possibly can because swaddling mimics the proprioception. Use white noise, the bonding squares, minimally medically handing, handling after the baby has returned to the nest. Let that baby go back into deep sleep and just do what we call look-see observations for at least four to six hours and ensure that the area stays darkened and quiet. So what is early intervention for you in intensive care? Maintaining the routine, so let mom daily do um, skin to skin. If you are bathing, use the B routine, which is bath and massage. Starting tummy time at 38 weeks and giving a lot of support to the parent. So this baby I need to tell you about is baby of Sakani. I can't give you his name because he has not been shown to the parents yet, the grandparents yet. He was born at 30, 22 weeks, zero days. He weighed 476 grams. Otis, oh no, Curtis, the baby that's the smallest baby that was born at 30, 30, 21 weeks weighed 450 grams. This baby spent 146 days in intensive care, went home on oxygen. He came to us battling to regulate and he started our early intervention therapy at week five. You can see how big this baby is. This is a normal pen. This is him and this was a month ago. So he now is currently 11 months he is seven months and three weeks. Um, he's able to roll from back to front. He sits unaided. He's now stopped his oxygen a month ago. And on checking yesterday, he was still off oxygen. He's starting to show signs now of creeping and his ROP has resolved. And I just want to show you, there's the evidence. Look at him sitting. Look at him making normal movements for a six month corrected age. For 10 months, he hasn't caught up yet, but he's getting there. And watch his eye contact with mom. This is phenomenal for that age. These are two so this baby was 25 weeks and four days. This was 26 days completely. She weighed 20 grams. He was 72. This was him. Hello. I'm Gungawa, mommy. Gungawa, where's your ear? Yeah, Gungawa, where's your mouth? Yeah, Gungawa, where's your nose? Where's your nose? Yeah. Where's your head? Yeah. 
No delay developmentally at this stage and both doing really, really well. So I am now at the end of this massive project. Here's some reading for all of you. And that's us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. I think today's lecture was really uh, one of the most comprehensive lectures that we had over the entire year because today we covered the uh, physiology of the brain development of the neonates. We also touched base on the HIE and the potential treatments. And then, of course, you addressed today the importance of developmental care or um, providing neuroprotective environment for the babies, for the newborns and the NICU. So, yeah, I think it was really, really uh, an excellent lecture today. Uh, thank you so much for preparing again such an outstanding uh, material. Um, we will open the floor to the question now. So we will have um, another, now another possibility to answer your questions. If you do get any questions, please type them in into the question box. So today, at, um, I mentioned, or oh, as Linda mentioned, we've covered quite a few topics, and we just would like to demonstrate on how Drager can support the developmental care in the NICU. And the first um, uh, topic that I would like to address is the um, treatment of a HIE or the neonatal cooling. So we, as Linda has mentioned, that the treatment needs to start within the first six hours um, of the hypoxic event in order to avoid the secondary um, failure. And obviously, you would need to have a certain devices or certain equipment in order to perform the cooling of the babies. And there are different equipments that are available. So we have, uh, obviously, our per usual, we have the cooling gels and ice packs, which are also used not in the developing in the developing countries only, but sometimes also in the developed countries. And we have more servo control devices, which um, are performing or offering the whole body cooling. We in Drager Incubator, so here I have a Baby Leo TM500. We in um, a Drager Incubators, we do not perform an active cooling, but we have um, an application that supports the cooling procedure. And this cooling procedure called Tolerate Cooling. So what we can do by activating um, tolerating the cooling, what happens? You can see that the uh, heat sources, so the air, the air, or basically the fan inside the incubator compartment and the mattress are switched off. The humidity is switched off, but we can also turn it on. But please know that the higher the humidity inside the compartment, the higher the temperature. So we can activate the humidity, we can still activate the oxygen inside the compartment. And also what's very important is that 
we have special alarm limits for the tolerating cooling procedure. So basically you can set up the alarms for the central and for, for the very um, temperatures. And um, as Linda has mentioned, the recommendation or the recommended temperature within which the baby's temperature needs to be maintained is between 33 and 34 degrees Celsius. So we can actually set a specific alarm. We can set the specific alarms uh, for the uh, for the um, for the tolerate cooling procedure. So now, of course, obviously our temperature is quite low. Let me just reduce the temperature again to not to avoid the alarm. So now you have a possibility to uh, perform the cooling procedure in a controlled environment. So basically, baby Leo can support your cooling procedure. But also, we took it to the, uh, to the next level. Not only we tolerating cooling, but we can also offer a graduate warming up. So basically, after the, I know that Linda has mentioned um, that the cooling needs to be done for at least 48 hours, and I think literature suggests that uh, the baby can be cooled down for up to 72 hours. There's no uh, further evidence or there's no further improvement of the outcome up to the 72 hours. And after, so basically any time between 48 and 72 hours, we can start with the warm up procedure. So we can uh, set the target value for the central skin temperature. So and in our case, it would be 36.6, 36.7, or even 37 degrees. We can also define the temperature step. So the temperature step can be anything between 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 degrees. And we also can define the interval at which the temperature will be changed. So we can start uh, either basically with 10 minutes or 60 minutes. And uh, the device will calculate the time that is needed to warm up the baby to the desired temperature. So we can now activate warm, uh, uh, warming up and you can see that we are now performing a warm up and uh, we are now have a close loop or a cerebral controlled application where we are gradually increasing the output inside the incubator in order to reach 0 0.3 degrees increase every hour. So that means that in about 20 hours or slightly more than 20 hours, our baby will reach the desired temperature. So having this possibility uh, provides you with a better and more controlled environment uh, for the uh, rewarming of the babies. This can also be used quite uh, nicely for the babies who are coming from the transport. We know that not in every facility we have access to the transport incubators, and I have seen this in my, uh, um, in my experience, that for example, in some Asian countries, in Vietnam, the babies are being transported in just wooden boxes covered with blankets. And of course, the risk of uh, experiencing the heat loss and the hypothermia is much higher for those babies. And we see that those babies sometimes uh, uh, arrive with hypothermia to the unit. And in order to ensure a smooth and uh, controlled warm-up, we can also perform the gradual rewarming. Also, what can be useful in a uh, baby layer that we also have the procedure which is called weaning. So weaning, um, weaning um, is the procedure that supports the weaning from the closed incubator to the open care worm. 
So what we do, we uh, basically, we can set the target value for center skin temperature. So for example, our target value is 36.8. Uh, we allow for plus minus 0.5% uh, degrees uh, variation. So if the baby can maintain the temperature within this range, at a uh, temperature inside incubator, let's say, of 30 or let's say 32, for example, um, then the baby will be ready for, um, for weaning. So basically for trans transforming from closed care to the open care operation. So these are some of the procedures that can support already the developmental uh, care practices, especially that are relevant not just uh, to the protection of the brain, but also to the term regulation and creating term neutral environments for the preterm infants. Um, another thing that I would like to address and let me just quickly cancel the warm up so i'm going to switch it off so another thing that i would like to address and linda has also talked about it this briefly on how to create uh, a neuroprotective environment in the NICU. we know that the baby has probably has six senses and the baby or, or adults as well basically a human being is perceiving the world through these six senses. So when the baby is in utero, uh, there is obviously not complete quietness or not complete darkness. So the baby is experiencing the light through the mom. If the baby is born too soon, and um, obviously if the brain development has not completed, uh, this positive stimuli can become a negative stimuli. And uh, Linda has mentioned in her lecture that uh, having excessive noises or having excessive lights can be detrimental to the baby uh, brain development. That's why in the baby, uh, baby Leo TM500, we have an option for monitoring of the noise and the light level. And uh, this actually helped me as well when I do demonstrations to the clinicians. And uh, I used to wear uh, jewelry when I did that. And I would just, uh, obviously there was no baby in the incubator, but I had a habit where I would just put a hand on top of the incubator. And then you can see how the sound, even from the slide, especially I have no jewelry now, but like the sound of, uh, of my voice, the sound of the, the sound of the touch of the incubator, we can see immediately that it increases the uh, noise inside the baby compartment. And if we look at the Pediatric Association uh, of uh, or American Association of Pediatrics, they recommendation that the noise level inside the baby compartment should be maintained at uh, below 47 decibels. And on the other hand, we all worked in the NICU and we all been in the NICU and we know that at times it can get relatively loud, especially during the visiting hours. So we have parents, we have noises coming from the alarms, we have um, interventional uh, alarms for when we perform any interventions. And now we have actually a possibility to observe and monitor the noise level, which can also help you to potentially reduce the level of the noise. And in the baby layer, we also have a developmental care view where not only you can see um, the measurement of the noise and the light level, but also the trended parameters. And if you see that your noise level is trending upwards, you might consider reducing the noise level in the NICU. Or if, obviously, it doesn't get too quiet, uh, but uh, if, let's say, the noise level goes down and 
uh, you feel like this might be too quiet for the baby, we can then, of course, offer a more positive stimulation. Similar to the light, so we can activate, for example, the light, and you can see that the light goes up immediately. So now I'm going to turn on the lights in the studio. And you can see that the light went up uh, tremendously. So we have a significant increase. So even the, even the slightest changes in the lighting can have an impact and we can see it immediately. So now uh, the possibility to measure the light uh, can help you to offer a more neuroprotective environment for your babies. So I can now switch off the observation light and we see how our light level went down immediately. And again, we can observe this on the trended uh, screen for the lights and for the noise monitoring. There is also a possibility, I'm not sure how practical this is, but we've tried it in a few units that there is also a possibility to connect an iPad, an iPhone, or any sound producing machine and play the music or play mother's voice or play mother's heartbeat inside the baby compartment. We have a connection on the side of the incubator that allows us to connect an auxiliary cable and basically connect a sound producing machine, an iPod, iPod uh, an iPhone and play mother's voice or mother's heartbeat, which also showed to have a positive stimuli to the um, uh, hearing system of the preterm infants. Um, of course, if we look at the uh, overall view, so if you look at the overall device operation, video does support the concept of developmental care. We have, for example, a uh, observational light integrated, which can be controlled uh, in three steps. And we also have an observation light that can be activated inside the baby compartment. So uh, currently, let me just check. <laughs> so the light is located, the light is located here. So when I turn it on, it's just a small lamp that activates. So for example, when we have a dark environment in the NICU, and or for example, when the baby incubator is covered with the, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when the baby is covered under the hood cover, we can just have this night light to quickly check on the baby and we can deactivate it. So uh, baby Leo also, of course, supports the concept of kangaroo care. And I think I have demonstrated this in one of my previous lectures, but I can show it once again. Um, we also have the application that is called a kangaroo mode. So basically during the kangaroo mode, uh, we disable all the nuisance alarms that can have an impact on the uh, mother and child bonding and um, we disabled some of the alarms if we look at the alarms we have special alarms for the kangaroo mode so we can uh, only set up the lower temperatures uh, lower temperature alarms alarms we offer longer temperature sensors that would allow the mom to feel more comfortable with her baby during the uh, kangaroo care. Also during the kangaroo care, when we activate the kangaroo care um, on baby Leo, but it's also available in the Isolate 1000 Plus, um, we are maintaining the same environment in the baby compartments. So when we, for example, take out the baby uh, from the incubator, um, so when we take the baby out, I uh, think would be to the side panel, we can take the baby out, or we can open the hood 
take the baby out for the um, mother care, we can close the incubator. Obviously, it's not going to be the case like that. And then the incubator will maintain the same temperature inside the incubator. So after the kangaroo care, when the baby needs to go back to the um, uh, to the incubator, the baby will go back to the same environment. So, um, and we at Drager, we truly believe that creating neuroprotective environment is essential for the better outcome of the neonates in the neonatal care units. And Linda has mentioned today a lot of different topics and I think it's quite important that the manufacturers align with the clinical practices and offer the right tools to the clinicians to address these developmental topics because this is one of the key topics when it comes to the uh, growing and the development of the extremely low birth and extremely young or low gestational age newborns. So thank you everyone for your attention. And with this, we would like to wrap up the session today about the nervous system of the premature and of, of the newborn. Uh, we can open the floor for the final questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, please type them in into the question box. And um, in the meantime, I just would like to address a few organizational topics. So today we conclude our Drager Digital Neonatal Nursing course. I've seen a couple of names, the names that have been with us for the past eight modules. So I would like to thank you for your attention, for your dedication and for your interest. I think uh, you all, all of you, all of your neonatal nurses are doing an amazing job and we are very happy to be part of this overall concept of creating better life for, for newborns. So we would like to thank you all for your participation. For those of you who would like to receive certificates of participation, we will be gladly, uh, we, will, we will glad to share those certificates. All of the modules are available on our website and on YouTube. For those of you who cannot find certain modules, please reach out to us and we will provide all the necessary links. And uh, again, I would like to thank Linda for the tremendous work that, um, that Linda has conducted in the past uh, 12 months. She has relentlessly worked very hard in order to create this very comprehensive lectures. She dedicated hours and hours of her time to share this knowledge with all of you. So Linda, thank you very much for being part of this course, for initiating this course and for providing your uh, daily support. So we are very grateful and thank you for being our lecture during the digital neonatal nursing course. So far, I do not see any questions. Linda, would you like to share um, a couple of final comments? Um, thank you so much, um, Margarita. That's actually quite touching. Um, I, I think that going forward, we would like everybody to reach out if there are problems, if we need to help, and they can reach out to you. Um, I am sure that you and Katya don't mind sharing my details, and if there is anybody who needs any help. But I think what we tried to achieve with this um, webinar series was to equip staff to understand how equipment and physiology, anatomy and disease process actually all interlinks and how we are all colleagues within the system. And I'd just like to thank um, Katya and yourself for all the support I've received since starting the process. 
and it has just been wonderful to see all the people, the comments, and what we have received. And thank you to every one of you who have stayed with us or been with us on this journey. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, everyone. And I would like to wish you a merry upcoming Christmas, a happy new year, and we hope to connect back in 2022. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day ahead.